Okay, I think time now to begin. We, we started a little bit late, you know, to, to be fashionable. So uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our third panel discussion uh, of the conference. Uh, this panel is entitled Climate Action in Language Assessment and will be chaired by Christopher Graham. Uh, Chris is a freelance English language teaching consultant, uh, teacher, educator, and author uh, based in the UK. Uh, he has worked in the field since 1981 in over 30 countries for the British Council, Ministries of Education, and international publishers. Uh, in 2020, his projects included working on approaches to the digital provision of ELT during COVID-19 in fragile locations and delivering a large-scale professional development program online for the British Council in North Africa. Uh, he is one of the founders of ELT Footprint, uh, a 2020 Elton winner. Uh, and across 2021, he has been working on research, materials writing, and media activities around ELT and climate change for the British Council uh, as part of the Climate Action in Language Education project. Very impressive. Uh, just to remind you, this session is 75 minutes long and questions from the audience are definitely encouraged. Uh, please just type them into the chat box during any time of the discussion. Uh, I will now hand over to Chris, who will help to introduce the other panellists. Uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. You make me sound much more interesting than I am. That's very kind of you. Um, so uh, maybe the rest of the panel, you could uh, switch your cameras on now so we, we, we can see you rather than uh, just, just little black screens. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's good morning for me, sitting in grey, wet South London. I think most people here are probably somewhere warmer and sunnier, even though maybe towards the end of your day, and I'm rather envious of you, I have to say. Um, what I'll do very briefly, first of all, is to tell you how, how the 75 minutes are going to be organised. In a second, I'll give a brief introduction uh, to each of the panellists sitting, sit, sitting with us. Um, after that, I'll give a little bit of context and overview of, 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 of the climate change assessment language training uh, interaction, if you wish, the, the connectivity between the, the two themes. Um, then each of the panellists sitting here will give a, a, a brief presentation, a few words, a statement about their view, their position on this topic, which hopefully will start to get those questions coming because we do want to, to have questions from you. So if you have, if, if you're listening, if you think of something, put it in the chat box and it will get sent up to me. And towards the end, there'll be a chance to to uh, to answer those questions. After the, the panel members have finished their um, their, their, their statements, uh, there'll be a few questions from me and some discussion. And then, as I say, an opportunity for, for Q&A from, from the people who who are watching so that's the structure hopefully it will go according to plan things don't always go according to plan as you probably know but that's what we're trying to do um so let me briefly uh, introduce each of the panelists um the natural aging process means that my memory is getting worse i've got it all written down so i can remember what to say i'll start talking about vicky evans vicky is the newly appointed head of sustainability for cambridge university press and assessment and has worked across cambridge assessments since 2014 focused on international curriculum redevelopment, customer and community engagement, employee experience and communications. Vicky now leads on developing the organization's approach to sustainability, covering the embedding of the UN Global Compact and the US sustainability goals into strategy, the development of the organization's Carbon Zero 2048 plan, and growing the CUPNA approach to education and engagement in sustainability. She seems to be the right woman in the right place at a very important turning point for all of us, I think, in, in climate. Um, Paul Giller, Professor Paul Giller, is a graduate of Queen Mary and Imperial College London and is also Emeritus Professor in Ecology at University College Cork in the Republic of Ireland, National University of Ireland. He has over 145 peer-reviewed publications and seven books to date, and he's an elected member of the Royal Irish Academy. Paul taught and researched at, in UCC for over 35 years and has also taught and or researched a period of time in China, UK, USA, Sweden, South Africa and France. He has significant experience of research and quality reviews and 
one of the really interesting things that 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 that, that once me, I wanted to get Paul onto this panel was he's recently completed. I mean, literally, it was published a, a couple of weeks ago. A report entitled "E Proctoring in Theory and Practice: A Review." And those of you working uh, at the, the sharp end, as it were, of assessment, I'm sure will agree that e proctoring is going to be something that that's becoming bigger and larger and larger on our on our screens, let's say, and Paul's report is extremely comprehensive. It's commissioned by the Quality and Qualifications Authority in Ireland. Um, that, now we come to Yasmin. Yasmin writes, she's a senior statistical analyst in the Pearson Test of English Psychometrics and, management, and Measurement Team with a drive to make positive change in sustainable learning. Her background is in natural sciences, majoring in mathematics and chemistry, and she spent four years applying this knowledge, and she says learning so much more, to develop, improve, and maintain high quality tests for English language learners. Choosing to combine these with her strong interest in looking after our people and our planet led her to become the sustainability advocate for the English language learning division at Pearson. And last but not least, least Steve Adams is Regional Exams Director East Asia for the British Council. Um, he's worked in the field of English teaching and assessment for 34 years as a, as a starting officer teacher in Turkey and he's since then worked in the UK, Ireland, Brazil, Singapore, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Kenya, Dubai and China. That's quite a journey, Steve, isn't it? He has a degree in genetics, an MS in English teaching, MBA and certificates and a diploma in teaching and teacher training. And as I say, he, he is now the Regional Exams Director at East Asia for the British Council. So we've got an interesting combination of skill sets there, I think. Um, and I'd like just to, to speak very briefly now about, to give a little bit of an overview. I suppose to an outsider, somebody not in the English language teaching and learning and assessment community, uh, activity around English teaching and assessment and climate change, people might say, well, what's the connection? I, I don't see a clear connection. If you stop somebody in the street, they might say, well, that's all very interesting, but what's, what's English teaching and measurement got to do with climate change? What's the connection? Um, well, I think, I suppose, we as a global community, the English language learning and assessment community are no different from any other professional global community. We are making a climate impact. And the work that I've been doing over the last year, I've been looking at the different stakeholders within, within English language teaching and learning and publishing, including um, publishers, assessment authorities, um, institutions. And the model that I've been using is in a sense, a continuum that every stakeholder at one end has their operational impact. All of us in our community have an impact, a negative impact on the environment. In many cases, we fly a lot or have flown a lot, thanks to COVID, less now. We've flown a lot. We often use a lot of paper. We ship things around the world in boxes and we ship them back again. Um, we keep our institutions cool if we're in Singapore. We keep them warm if we're in Alaska, somebody maybe teaches English in Alaska. So we, we, we're often quite big users of resources. So we all at one end of that continuum have a, have, are having a negative impact on the environment. But equally, the other end of the continuum is the opportunity that we have. Um, John Nagg from the British Council came up with a wonderful statistic a few years ago that at any one time, there are one and a half billion people, that's billion, not million, billion people learning English in the world. And I've taken a long time to count them. But that's, if you actually stop and think, that is a huge number of people. Now, all of us, whether we work on in, in, in the delivery of, of English language teaching or whether we're involved in the assessment side, which of course are so intimately linked, that means we are probably extraordinarily potentially influential because we have the possibility to intervene on curriculum, the way things are tested, content of a very large community of people around the world learning English. And if you think about it, the connection between English and the climate emergency is fairly direct. Engl the English language is the language of the climate debate. Like it all, don't like it, it's a fact. The climate debate is largely held in English. COP26 was held in English, apart from politicians who tend to use interpreters, everybody else, the academics, all the other speakers who are operating in English. It's also the language for protest. And Greta Thunberg, you know, at the age of 16, addressed the UN in a language that is not her own. That's quite a feat for any, for any, any young student, I think. Um, it's the language of protest. The banners, the placards in the streets, climate protests around the world are in English. So 
that level of engagement with the climate debate is something that we are facilitating by being involved in the English language teaching and learning community. So the connectivity between our community and, and the climate debate is very strong, I think. And the British Council for the last year to 18 months, and I've been involved in some of these projects, have got a whole series of initiatives around, around climate change and the way we can mitigate it in terms of our behaviours and the way we can also take those opportunities to integrate climate into what we teach. Um, and there's, the, the, there's, there's a huge MOOC for teachers, a massive open online course for teachers around the world who want to bring climate topics into their classes. There's a series of lesson plans, there's podcasts, there's a, a research project that's, that I'm just finishing now. There's a lot of the activities going on around there. But one of, of course, one of the biggest stakeholder groups in, within the English language teaching community is the testing and assessment community, which is why we're here today. Um, so you probably heard quite enough from me, people usually do. So what I'd like to do now is to give each of my colleagues here a little bit of time to talk about their position, give their views. And this is the time when you might want to start preparing some questions to be used later on. So I'd like to start with Steve, if I may, Steve, the floor is yours. Great, thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, well, well from my perspective, I mean, the last, the last two years of pandemic have been so awful in, in so many ways. However, I feel that there is, there is somewhat of a silver lining to some of this uh, and that is around the innovation that's been happening. Uh, the pandemic and the travel restrictions that we've all faced uh, have driven so many alternative approaches to exam delivery uh, that have been necessary to ensure uh, continuity of service. For example, if we just take IELTS as an example, there's been a much higher uptake in IELTS on computer instead of IELTS uh, using paper and pen. And um, even though that was partly driven by the pandemic, it did lead uh, to a lot of saving in terms of printing and logistics. Also, the use of video technology uh, has saved a vast amount of travel. And in other exams, we've moved from large venue based paper and pen exams to exams that are now being taken at home on people's own devices. And, and if we're honest about this, I mean, saving carbon and greening up really was not the initial objective of these innovations at all. But the savings, I think, are on such a scale that we can't ignore them. Let me give you some numbers. So for the current 12 month period, just in China, in the move to IELTS on computer instead of IELTS on paper, thanks to less paper printing, fewer use of couriers and speaking patch, pack dispatches, We've saved the equivalent of over 19,000 kilograms of carbon, which is the equivalent to 386 trees. However, the big news is around the use of video technology. So by using video speaking interviews instead of sending examiners out for face-to-face -face interviews, um, and in China, that means a lot of people traveling out all over the country from our four offices, um, and assuming that half of that travel would have been playing by plane and half by train, we can just realize some incredible savings. So first of all, by train, we've saved a million kilometers of travel in this move, which is the equivalent of 37 million kilograms of carbon. And from air travel, it's absolutely jaw dropping. We've saved basically 2.14 million kilometers of travel through using video, which is the equivalent of 297 million kilograms of carbon or 3.6 million trees in total. And I think that's absolutely jaw dropping. So altogether, that's the same as running 90 wind turbines for a whole year. So if you take, if you look at IELTS globally across our sounds and IDP, across the whole network, it's going to be an awful lot more than that. So like I said at the start, we didn't set out with carbon targets in mind, but this is on such a significant scale that I argue that we need to go one step further here and really, you know, capitalize on this, set ourselves some really ambitious carbon targets and make every effort to achieve them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Indeed, staggering figures, aren't they? That re really is food for thought. Vicky, can we move on to you, please? Thank you. So, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, 
it's really lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, that's a really, really great intro for me from Steve. Um, so I'm Head of Sustainability for um, Cambridge University Press and Assessment, we're a newly merged organisation. So the uh, Cambridge English um, portfolio has, has now been merged with our um, extensive university um, publishing arm. And we really as an organisation, I would say just at the beginning of our sustainability journey, it's, it's something that we've been um, interested in for, for a long time. We've had sustainability content embedded across our curricula, um, whether that's that's English or in other areas for a number of years. And we have a um, extensive sustainability publishing program. But in terms of actually looking to strategically reduce our carbon, um, we, we really feel that we are just at the beginning um, of our journey. And as Steve mentioned, COVID is quite an unusual time to be to be beginning that journey where we're already seeing significant savings as a result of a huge switch to digital um, by learners and professionals across across the world um, so beginning a journey to carbon zero when your carbon is already significant uh, significantly lowered is both an opportunity and a challenge to ensure that we are finding ways that to, to not increase again um, so at, um, press and assessment our um, approach covers three different areas primarily we um, we have a high level target um, along with the University of Cambridge to achieve carbon zero by 2048 and that's an absolute zero carbon target so it's our approach at the moment not to follow offsetting um, that we are looking for absolute um, zero across our operations um, and we're focusing significantly on uh, wider environmental impacts um, so obviously, as an assessment organisation it's, it's an, and a publishing organisation, it's, it's an unavoidable fact that our paper um, consumption is absolutely enormous. Um, so what can we do as an organisation to work collaboratively um, with other assessment organisations, with our printers, um, with our distribution centres and our, our learning centres to, to drive that paper consumption down whilst making a, a, a safe and secure move over to digital and I know we'll, we'll talk about this as a panel later on, but that's a, that's a huge challenge for us, um, switching to um, a digital service that we know is going to provide the, the, the quality and the, the security that our, our learners um, expect. Um, but that, I think collaboration is something that's, that's really, really key. Um, sustainability is not going to be achieved by one organization alone um, it's something that we're all in together and that's very much um, at the heart of our approach and I'm really really interested to to, to hear some questions um, from people in the audience today um, around the things that matter to them some ideas some suggestions um, as to what they'd like to see um, we work with um, a number of organizations researching digital impact for example we work with a number of universities in the UK um, around measuring our, our digital impact and trying to take a, a, a footprint um, for what that activity looks like. So I'm really, really keen to hear from the audience as well about efforts that perhaps they might be interested in, in seeing or working with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, very much. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. I think you'll have some slides and I think Jonathan's going to be your your operator for those. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Chris. And hello, hello, everybody. If you could put my my slides up, Jonathan, please. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a, I suppose, a rather different tack from from um, the last two panelists by just considering the the other side of the of the online um, assessment and online delivery which is how you manage the exam integrity. And COVID, I think, has provided a very good test case to examine the challenges and the use of online language assessment taken from home. And that, that switch to accepting at-home proficiency tests raises concerns for a variety of reasons to many stakeholders. There are technological demands, there's exam security, there's the validity of, of scores, et cetera. And given the, the very high stakes of language test results, providers have, have turned to online security measures and particularly to e-proctoring. Next, please. 
so what what is e-proctoring um remote online or e-proctoring is a very general term covers a range of different approaches that try to simulate on-site supervised exam conditions as you can see on the on the picture to the right now at, at its simplest e-proctoring is a form of invigilation which involves monitoring of the student behavior during online exams and the monitoring is usually done by proctors at the other end of a computer screen as you can see in that, that middle photo in an office of one of the big proctoring companies next please the, the monitoring is usually carried out through the webcam or and or the, the microphone on the student's computer and it includes monitoring of the screen and of computer activity and the the panel at the bottom just shows what a proctor's view of the student taking an exam is you you have on the left there you have the um, webcam of the student's face many proctor systems require a second camera placed behind the student with a, a smartphone for example in the middle panel and then also the proctor can actually see what's happening on the computer screen of the student next please so there, there are three main um, proctoring approaches on the left there are human-led live proctoring that most closely resembles traditional exam hall invigilation and the invigilator or the proctor is remotely monitoring the behavior of the student they can be monitoring anywhere up to 32 candidates at a time although it's more usual to, to have many fewer but it's limited scalability this approach and it's also the highest cost. The, the middle panel there recorded proctoring, where the audio and the camera and other data is recorded during the exam, and then it's reviewed by proctors after the exam. Um, and it can be reviewed by um, a, an actual human or by artificial intelligence software as well to, to look for suspicious behaviors that might reflect cheating. It's much more scalable, potentially large numbers of students can sit the exams at one time. And on the, the third uh, box there, the automated AI proctoring, where these artificial intelligence bots use advanced analytics and algorithms to authenticate identity, to check on the uh, conditions in the room, to monitor the internet use, and it basically replaces proctors during live proctoring, or these AI bots can review recorded exams. And that offers the most scalable solution, and it's potentially the, the most efficient in terms of time and cost. Next, please. But proctoring of online exams carries many problems, and these have been identified across a range of publications in, in the literature. I've just highlighted that the key ones here, there are privacy and legal issues uh, which arise while the student's being observed. There's issues around data retention and data protection issues. And there have been many examples of actual data breaches um, and um, stealing of information from the students. There's student stress and anxiety that has been highlighted because of the loss of privacy and the intrusion into the student's own living accommodation. Digital poverty or the digital divide is, is a very important one where you can get disadvantages to students who can't access suitable technology or have a low level of digital literacy or poor internet connectivity. You have the opposite in a way with very high tech uh, qualified students can actually uh, game the system. They have found ways of overcoming the e proctoring uh, controls and uh, can carry out fraud and cheating. Detecting cheating, detecting fraud is difficult. It can be challenging to prove um, that cheating has taken place. And there's lots of examples of misidentification. And there's also biases 
that are, are apparent against different kinds of students, especially with the um, automatic, the um, artificial intelligence proctoring. And, and finally, there's the reliability of technology, log on problems, problems with facial recognition for certain students, and again, the potential for discrimination. Next one, please. So finally, just a couple of, um, of general considerations. Uh, I think e-proctoring has offered a very clear and a very rational option to the largely unplanned and widespread and large scale increase in online delivery and a remote online assessment during COVID. Beyond that pandemic, beyond COVID, the consideration of, of fair access and opportunity, as well as climate change issues may lead to a greater and continued use of online assessments. And that raises the issues of exam security and integrity for the high stake assessments and hence e-proctoring. But the issues accompanying e-proctoring of online assessments, such as student stress, data protection, privacy, and digital poverty, to me suggest that widespread use may actually be premature and that we should start looking at alternative modes of assessment and delivery. Next one. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Well, that's certainly food for thought there, isn't it? Um, certainly food for thought. Fascinating. Yasmin, over to you, please. Thank, thank you. you very much. And um, thank you very much for having me today. It's a real pleasure. So um, I became the sustainability advocate for the English language learning division at um, for Pearson this year um, so fairly new to it but a lot of it is because of the interest that I have in sustainability and my desire to look after our planet and our people um, so it's our responsibility all of our responsibility to do what we can to look after it it's our responsibility to work together educate future generations and do so in a sustainable way so that's producing products that actually allow each other and our planet to thrive. So last year, Pearson renewed its ambition of sustainability by signing the Sustainability Business Plan 2030. Um, so within this, it covers three areas. Um, so it's leading responsibility, learning for everyone and learning for a better world. Um, and it's the leading responsibility pil uh, pillar that's a Pearson wide goal and that covers the environmental aspects and some of the things that have been mentioned already. Um, and that includes about having a net zero uh, carbon emission target by 2030. Um, so Pearson's big aim is to basically have a world where there is opportunity. Every person on the planet has access to quality education and lifelong learning that actually empowers them to improve their lives. Um, and the communities around them, but also it looks after our planet. And combining this with my huge interest in mental health and well-being, it brings in another branch that we need to consider. Uh, and Paul just touched on this uh, a second ago. Um, but the well-being of our students, our teachers, customers, employees, future generations, it's really important. Mental health is really, really important. And there's so much more we all need to learn about it. I find there's such beauty in people's individualities and all of the unique things that are in this world, but how do we move forward and how do we celebrate those things, but how do we do it in a sustainable way? And that is a collective effort. It's not something that any of us can do alone. Yasmin, thank you very much indeed. So we've got four very different different takes on this, which which is which is great. It's exactly what, what I hope would happen. So what we'll do now, um, uh, we're going to initially, as I say, open up some discussion within the panel. I've got some some, some things that I'd like to ask uh, individuals, or, 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 or in some case, more than one individual. 
and then after that we were i've already seen some questions are coming up from the floor in the chat box and uh, we'll endeavor to get to those i apologize in advance if if we do have a number of questions if i miss any um don't take it personally i do my best and i'm quite sure jonathan will give me subtle hints as well if i do but um please don't take it if, if i do miss, miss your question when the time comes um the first question i'd like um to ask steve and vicky i'll start with you steve and, and then go over to vicky is um before our friend COVID appeared on the scene, it seems like 30 years ago, in fact, it was this fairly recent. Before COVID, was there much discussion in the assessment community around the environmental impact or the, the, the greening of the testing and assessment process, Steve? There was some. I think it was, I think it was starting, and I think um, uh, for a long time, quite a few years ago now, uh, one of our previous uh, board members once uh, described the whole exams operation as logistics, just logistics. And of course, you know, uh, coming from the academic side of things, uh, you know, I, I obviously clearly rejected that. No, 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 it's far more than logistics. But then ever since that time, I've just been reflecting on how much of what we do really is moving around vast amounts of paper and vast amounts of people and bringing together in, in vast air conditioned rooms in order to, you know, to, to, to scribble on paper that's then packed off and sent by aeroplane again. And, and people were starting to realize, I think came, you know, um, Vicky would probably bear witness to this, but I mean, people were certainly becoming very aware of the amount of paper that was wasted particularly in IELTS, um, when, you know, uh, we weren't, you know, we were sort of per hundred papers that we ordered, uh, maybe only 70 candidates in the end were coming for the exam, and that was an awful lot of waste. So this kind of discussion was going on. And of course, there was a vast amount of awareness around the amount of travel involved in IELTS, especially when you started uh, totting up the numbers. You know, I've done that from the perspective of carbon, but there's also a pound cost to all of that travel as well. So for a long time, we've been thinking, you know, this is just incredibly, incredibly wasteful. You know, is there a better way to do this? So, so yes, I think, I think the discussion had been there amongst many other discussions and, and, and live issues at the time for, for many years. But like I said at the start, I think the pandemic has thrown into sharp focus a number of issues uh, that weren't necessarily as prominent before. And, and, and climate saving carbon alternative technologies are one of these. And I think it's also turning upside down some of our previous assumptions, for example, around the use of AI being universally good because it meant people didn't have to travel because I think there's a growing realization now that actually AI is incredibly carbon heavy. So I think, I think there, is, there is just a growing realization that all of these technologies can have a very positive impact, um, but they also have their own issues. So it's become, I think, I, think, I think over the pandemic, it's become considerably more sophisticated. I think that's what I'd say. There is certainly a feeling with, with the digital impact, uh, the, the negative um, impact of, of, of digital is you can't win some, sometimes, isn't it? We, I mean, yeah. Vicky, what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, it's interesting because, because obviously you're now in the merged, the merged organisation. You, you've got the press and the assessment. Um, publishers have been talking about green for quite a while, haven't they? So I, I wondered how, how you feel about that, 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 that pre and post COVID chatter in the corridors as it were yes yeah, certainly um certainly the, the publishing um profession covid has, has brought um the unsustainability of the mass consumption of paper sharply into focus and certainly what we and people being actually being able to access the physical product as well you know people just going to bookshops and purchasing things um is all of that was just disrupted um so we've been making a move to to online journal publications specifically for um a, a while now um but that in itself is a really complex process there's a there's a sort of a real um attachment to the books to the physical um and we've had to work really hard with um customers and stakeholders to ensure that the quality the accessibility 
um, of any content that we are producing is, you know, per perceived to be the same. Um, COVID has has helped, um, but certainly, um, I think we were surprised that perhaps customers weren't quite as ready to make make the jump um, as we were. Um, and certainly, this is an area that we, we're really, really interested in. There's also that, that an impact for digital. Um, so we're doing a lot of work um, around calculating the carbon footprint of our digital um, activity. And although, you know, it's it, it's good that the world is moving towards digital delivery um, of, of many things, but there is a carbon impact associated with anything that you host online, that you do online. And we're really, really aware that um, end user services, for example, the, the interaction of a user um, with any product or book or journal or assessment does have a carbon impact depending on the um, type of device they're using, whether it's a mobile device, it's a laptop, what energy that um, energy provider that user might be using. Um, so we can't we can't assume that you know moving to digital is always going to be the greener option. No, I think I think you're right. As I say, it, it's the feeling of oh you can't win. Yeah. <laughs> this. If we do that, oh, we can't. We do that. That's 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 that absolutely. It's a, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Thank you both. Um, this question will be for Paul, and I'll probably bring in Steve a little bit bit afterwards. Um, Paul, I mean, you, you made a. I thought your analysis of the, the whole. I don't know with remote proctoring, e proctoring, online proctoring, whatever the terminology you agree. The whole piece was was really interesting, and, and I learned quite a lot about it that I didn't know before as well. Um, as it becomes more prevalent, or is becoming more prevalent, do you think there's going to be, a, is there being, or has there been a lot of resistance from end users, from students or institutions? Paul, you're muted. Sorry. That's the uh, that's the COVID disease for too many online meetings. <laughs> you're muted. Um, yeah, no, there, there will be, and there has been. Um, there's, there's a lot of evidence of resistance. I mean, if you look at, for example, the university sector, you get um, many universities going whole hog into prop tree um, using AI. You have others voting never to use it and, and changing their modes of assessment to avoid it because of the problems. It's interesting with the with the students. You get an equal divide, and some students actually like they like it. They, they like the ability to take the exams in their own home. They like the um, the you know the, the technological use. Um, you know the modern day approach to examining using computers. Um, whereas others get really stressed. They get really anxious. Um, there's examples of, of students just failing to finish exams. Um, so you, you get the both, both pros and cons from both the providers and the, and the student stakeholders. Um, those issues I, I mentioned, the problems are, are, are real. There's many examples in the literature of these, of these problems uh, and they're being evaluated, they're being enumerated. Uh, and some of the proctor companies are trying to overcome some of these but th there's always going to be a challenge um to proctoring and, and and it's a balance you know the balance of the risk of all those problems versus the risk of fraud and failure of exam integrity mm -hmm. and the providers the institutions the assessors have got to look at that balance and decide and that's without looking at the, the climate side as well yeah that's almost coincidental in a sense though it's that obviously it's 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 from, from the climate aspect it, it it makes some sense steve you're you're you're, you're the, the sharp end and end user as you are and obviously have a lot of contact with, with institutions and students and, and people involved what is is the pushback is the reaction do you think negative reaction to to, to online proctoring or e proctoring well first of all <coughs> i mean take, taking one side of that uh, uh, because of e-proctoring, uh, many, many, many thousands of people have been able to take uh, exams that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to take over the pandemic. You know, just, just within our own organisation, I mean, many, many thousands of ACCA candidates, many, many thousands of IELTS candidates who took IELTS indicator instead. When all was closed, e-proctoring gave people a means to access their exam and progress with their, uh, their ambitions. 
So that's definitely a positive there. So, so I think people have accepted and being very grateful of that aspect of it. However, when it comes to, to situations where candidates have more of a choice, then yes, I mean, it hasn't been universally welcomed. And I mean, there are a couple of reasons for this. I mean, one reason is that uh, certainly with some tests, there's quite a complex ecosystem around, around the exam. It's not just a question of, of paying your fee and turning up for an exam. You have people who tell you which provider to go to. You have English schools who will help you prepare. You have agents helping you with your, your, your move to an overseas university who will be helping you to prepare for the test. And people put a vast amount of effort into, into that preparation. And if people have been prepared to take an exam on paper, then, then they like to take an exam on paper. Not only that, but people who don't use the, the Latin alphabet may not be familiar with Latin keyboards. They may be more used to, to Arabic keyboards, for example. So this is a factor that, 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 that sort of suggests that people would prefer paper and pen over any kind of electronic form of testing, including at home. And I think the third reason for pushback, where you see pushback, is not everybody has the conditions at home that are particularly conducive to taking a, a high stakes exam. You know, just speaking for my in-laws, um, they have three generations living in the same flat together. Uh, and that's a very, very common situation here in Asia. And there's not a quiet corner in the house where I think anybody would be, would be happy to sit and take a, a very high stakes um, a three hour exam, for example. So people may prefer to go to a, you know, a, a prepared, quiet exam venue. So it's, it's a complex, I think, social uh, and personal, and, and also potentially EDI in terms of first language and, and use of computers issue. Um, but, but again, within the pandemic uh, context, without it, a lot of people wouldn't have been able to take an exam at all. Yeah, I can see that there is a, it's, it's not straightforward at all. Not at all. Right. I'm going to go to Yasmin now, the and question. Just, oh, you, if you want to come in, Yasmin. I was just fine. going to come back in on that one. Yeah, Sorry. Sure. Um, just a couple of other things, really. Like, in terms of that, like Steve just said, it has, there has, it has given a lot of people opportunities. But what about the underserved communities? What about the people that don't have that set up? How do we reach those? And I, understand that they might not necessarily have that set up anyway but the move completely online how how realistic actually is that um so but and Steve you were saying about um like people set up at home and that sort of stuff so actually someone might have internet and a computer at home but is the equipment of a high enough quality that they can take a high stakes test? And actually then you have to think about if it's not of a high enough quality, how does that affect the validity of the test that they're taking? So can, can we take those tests that they take at home and use them for high stakes reasons, university entrance, or is it kind of a, a temporary a means and then when they have an opportunity to go to a test center they have to redo it so how how do you how do you go about that it's packed with challenges your question isn't it but uh, <laughs> i mean I, there, there, there is a question of equity there really is um but i mean there are a lot of questions in equity and access in access to education generally and this is just another one that's, that's folded in i've got a question for you yasmin but steve if you if you want to, to reply or, or paul either of you want to respond to that yeah, I, I wouldn't mind just to get a quick response to that because, you know, I, I think quite a lot about the digital divide, you know, from an exams operations perspective, because a lot, a lot is made uh, of the fact that underserved communities may not have access to digital technology. However, those underserved communities may have even less access to a secure testing centre, the nearest one of which may be in the capital city, um, two days drive away uh, and a very expensive uh, bus ticket away. So it's, it's not a given that, that digital, digital is all bad 
and uh, traditional testing is all good. And, and I was in Kenya uh, for a few years, lived in Kenya for a few years, when M-Pesa was the big thing. And that enabled tribes people all over the country to transfer money to each other digitally using their Nokia phones. So actually, all this talk of the digital divide needs to take into account that sometimes digital provides access to underserved communities that they wouldn't normally have. That said, I'm not 100% in favor. I completely agree with Yasmin that, you know, it's, it's horses for courses and, you know, there are various ways to look at this. Paul, did you want to, to, to say something on that? Yeah, what, what the approach that many um, providers and institutions have taken is to, is to give an option so students can either do it online at home or if they can't, if they haven't got the technology, haven't got the expertise, um, or perhaps students with disabilities as well find it difficult, they're allowed to come to a centre to take the same exam and the centre provides the equipment the, um, and the support if, if necessary. So that, that's the way it's been, uh, it's been approached you know, in, in, H, in, in higher education, I guess. Where, where you have um, you know, two, a two day drive to get to the exam center, the only approach that I could see is that you, you deliver exam centers more locally, which could actually increase to some extent the costs. Um, you reduce travel, you still reduce the paper, but you, you, know, you, you have to have more individuals um, involved, you have to have more local centres, and in those local centres, you provide the uh, technological facilities, the computers, the internet um, connections, etc., and manage the exam there. Okay, yeah, um, it's it's a minefield. Yasmin, question for you. Um, and, and Paul flagged this up in one of his slides. Um, the kind of mental health and well-being aspect of this. I mean, exams, you know pretty stressful at the very best of times, aren't they? We all have happy memories of walking into large echoing halls and sitting down and you know, opening the envelope in front of us on the desk. It's a different kind of stress now, isn't it, for if in, in the, the online space. Um, what can we do about student wellbeing and mental health around, particularly around our online uh, examinations delivered online, Jasmine? You're, so, oh, you're not uh, Yeah, mm. it's such an important question because it's, <laughs> you can't remove testing completely like there's there's ways kind of that these these types of testing they give people lots of opportunities to progress in the world and they give people things to focus on but actually a lot of us would have realized from having to work from home throughout the pandemic that bringing that um the kind of like more stressful situations that pressure of the work and like we're talking about now exams into your home environment how do you then separate that but if if your home for lots of people is your your safe space your your place to return after a stressful day it then it then becomes invaded by all those other things and and actually how how do you how do you do that in a manageable way that that does account for and does allow for people to still have that safe space at home. Um, I think a lot of it is a, a, needs to be about raising awareness. Um, and like Pearson had run a course uh, earlier on this year, um, Learners Insight Lab, it was called, and basically it all went into schools and um, spoke to students and they all had to, it was about sustainability and they were coming up with their own ideas on how actually we can approach it and for them what is important um, and that was it was really great to get the insights from them to see what they find is important and actually they're the ones that are at home learning they're the ones that are trying to fit it in with like there was one girl who lived at home and she had lots of siblings and there was one room where they had to study and they had to do um, they had to like switch between and have kind of rotor on how to do it so it's interesting hearing from people that are are in those environments on what helps them. So I, I, 
I think it is a, it's a lot about education and making awareness, introducing things into testing, into courseware, um, but also providing people with that safe space or that area where they can separate their their home life from from the testing. For me, physical health and mental health are so much part of the entire uh, sustainability debate. You know, living well, feeling well is very much part of uh, part of that continuum. I think. Um, I've got a question for Vicky in a second, but just to say, we are, we are getting some questions uh, coming in from the audience. But if you've got any more, please put them in the chat box because in a minute I'm going to going to switch across and, and see what you've said, um, Vicky. I mean, there's, whatever happens, there is going to be a degree of of continuation of paper-based exams, traditional exams, you know, people sitting down in rooms with a bit of paper in front of them for three hours doing whatever they do, that's going to be happening. How can we make that less damaging to the environment? What, what changes can we make in our processes? There's a number of measures we can take. Um, for example, <laughs> looking at um, the paper that you're using. So um, we're almost 100% um, FSC certified paper across our operations now, um, which means that we're reducing the impact that we have as an organization um, on land management, deforestation, and working with sustainable providers. And we are looking at uh, different mechanisms of printing so rather than printing centrally and shipping things around the world and it's sort of bespoke individual shipments we're looking at um, local printing and distributing using um, local suppliers um, but a, a large amount of this work is is very much in the um, what was called the, the scope three space so that's um, all of the carbon emissions that organizations and institutions are indirectly responsible it's the stuff that you can't control like um, travel and how your supply chain um, is producing carbon emissions um, we have to work with really really closely with our suppliers to go on that that journey together so we do an awful lot of work with our um, printers and printing companies that we use globally to support them to reduce their their carbon emissions um, so working together on specific contracts to source paper from a specific um and in fact a specific paper mill for example um supporting by maybe paying that little bit more to use the electric vehicles rather than the petrol based vehicles for distribution um, and then also working with um, the, the centres that we are, particularly our, our larger centres, um, to support them around um, the environment that they have. So looking at um, renewable energies, what are they doing in terms of um, waste and recycling? Um, how can we um, help them to adopt some of the practices and procedures that we might want to see? Um, we, you know, we're aware that learners are taking Cambridge exams we want them to be doing that in an environment where we're um, um, creating a, um, an environment where they feel perhaps inspired that um, they can see that we're taking good practices and also that we're working with um, our teachers and our school leaders um, around some of the environments in which the um, learners are taking their exams and that that's really not easy obviously we're talking about international context it's it's very easy within the UK to, to talk about using green energy and to talk about you know recycling um, but the picture is so very different internationally so it's it's not it's not an easy um, it's not an easy task and you really have to look at it almost on a sort of centre by centre city by city region by region basis it's and it's certainly not something that you can do in a sprint it's it's a it's a marathon a complex spider's web of different different uh, people up and down the supply chain isn't it uh, another question yeah. to, to anybody where uh, this will be the final question to you as a panel before before we start bringing in the uh, the uh, the audience Clearly, the, 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 that, there's been a forced move to, 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 to remote to refactoring, and, and I suspect there'll be some backsliding, if, if that's the right term. But it, who knows? We don't we don't know where we're going to be in a year's time, do we? With COVID and the rest of it, assuming that e proctoring stays with us and, and expands, is it likely to be more expensive for students? Is it going to cost more? Is it going to cost less? 
he says, Fitz, trying to sound optimistic about things. Does anybody have a position on that? Paul. It, Paul and then Steve, yeah, Paul. It, it depends on, on the approach that, that's taken. I mean, the, the automated proctoring is, is the cheapest. Um, it can be large scale, um, you know, lots of students taking at once and, and you've got the automated um, o- oversight, but it can also be the most intrusive. Um, the live proctoring with proctors watching you um, is the most expensive. And, uh, and many feel that that's the safest in, in a way. Uh, it's the closest to you know, proctoring in an exam hall. I, I think the, uh, the companies are responding to these problems that are being raised. Um, and cost is, is certainly one of them. Uh, but it, I think if, if the assessment um, overseers can start moderating and changing the approach to assessment that requires perhaps less um, kind of you know, written online testing uh, and more continuous type assessment or, uh, or video vivas things like that, you can reduce the the necessity for um, so many or or so long an exam online, and that can reduce the the cost as well. But at the end of the day, someone does have to pay for each option. Because it's not going to, yeah. It's not free. Of course. Thank you, Paul. Steve, have you on this? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a very straightforward business challenge. I mean, we know the cost of sessional paper and pen testing. And we have to pass that cost on to the candidates. So, so all of the numbers are there for um, sessional paper and pen. So what we now know is, is the threshold that we have to beat. So taking into account you know, all of the excellent points made in false paper and some of the things that we've been discussing today and all of the different issues, I think finding the right permutation that suits the needs of the board for security, the needs of the candidate takes into, takes into account the societal and welfare issues, that right combination. I think we need to play with this. We need to learn about it. We need to improve our technologies. And there's the bar. And we have to push, 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 push until we're beating that. And we will make it cheaper, more accessible. I'm convinced it can be done. But I think from a business perspective, we have a very clear line in the sand and a very clear threshold that we have to beat. And I think we have all of the the different pieces of the jigsaw. We just need to work out how to put them together in a way that makes it accessible and affordable, as well as carbon positive. So it's conversations with with the exam boards, conversations with end users, student bodies, institutions. Vicky, Yasmin, are are these dialogues happening? Do do, do you feel that there is this exchange of information? Either, either um, Vicky or yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, so I, I think we are taking steps to get there, but it's it's not a one person like Steve was like there are there are lots of bits of the puzzle, and whatever whatever path we go down, there's always going to be pros and cons of them. Um, there's always going to be costs involved in whatever solution we we choose. There will always be costs involved, but it's it's about out which which one kind of do we do we go with? And there won't be a, a one size fits all, and there's not a one thing that's right for this candidate or this test center or this testing company. It's not necessarily going to be right for every other testing company. So I think there needs to be the consideration of lots of different things. And I think sometimes there does people do want a one, a quick fix, a big solution, like the one solution and that magic potion kind of thing. But there there isn't that 
sorry to break it to Rob, but there is lots of there's lots of things that need to be considered and there's lots of people that need to be considered lots of products and lots of processes that need to be considered but we need to crack on don't we with the, the climate emergency chasing us the fires are chasing us somehow yeah. of course quick... yeah well, of course paul yeah so just a quick um a quick point chris the the most successful um examples of, of development and delivery of e-proctoring within institutions <laughs> have happened when there's been a very close partnership between the the uh, proctor company and the institution or the organization and they've worked together to identify the issues come up with the solutions and develop a you know a, a bespoke process and set of systems and that, that's probably what's necessary with the EFL as well. Those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think it is down to, it's, it's not just one company that's been doing the thing. And a lot of us are from educational companies. But like we were talking about earlier in terms of underserved communities, we we can support that move online or like kind of the set up things. But actually, as a company, as, a, as an educational company, we can't go in and put internet all over the world and we can't set up everyone's home in a perfect way. So actually it's, it's not just down to one of us. It's like you were saying, Paul, it is down to the, the collaboration. Like we need to work together to do what we can. It's not the responsibility of one person or one company. It's all of us together and we all have our own expertise. And actually we need to make the most of those and put those together. I agree. We need more forums, you see. It's the way forward. <laughs> okay, we've got about only about 10 minutes left. So I've got some some uh, questions and comments up from, from, from people who've, who, who've been listening. One or two as comments, I'll just share them very briefly. Um, Alex Mendoza says, we need to give serious thought to the impact of using devices on our health, especially our eyesight. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. And that, that ties with stuff that, 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 that Yasmin was saying earlier. Um, Cheryl Cook says, I'm really glad to see that issues such as digital poverty and the infringement of privacy are being considered when looking at remote proctoring. Can these issues be mitigated in any way? I think we've kind of talk, talked around some of these things. So if anybody wants to add anything to that, um, to what we've already said about the issues of, of as I said, privacy and the digital divide or digital poverty. I mean, we've, we've talked about Paul's idea on regional centres was one thing there. Steve? Yeah, just a very just a very brief comment. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about yet in this debate is, is the increase in choice. And I think yes. that's a very important factor, is, is it's not going to be all of this and all of that. It does actually enable us to offer people a choice. And I think that's very important. That's nice. Yeah, that, that's that's the way of the world. And I think it's, it's as you say, it, it's choices and and in some cases, it may only be one option for a given community. That's fine. At least they have a choice they to take the exam or not. Um, Claire Ryan asked the question, will e-proctoring change the type of test tasks? Well, it, it, it should. Um, because fraud is, is happening. It's, it's almost like an arms race between students who are, who are determined to cheat and... and uh, and the protection and security systems put in by the proctory. What's been found is that altering the actual assessment mode is the most effective way of overcoming the cheating, making the exams more um, bespoke to the individual student, um, making the assessment less um, uh, available for someone to find the answer on online by pressing a button and looking on the internet and you know using online dictionaries and things like that so but that requires a hell of a lot of of work by the assessors and the examiners and that's starting to happen now certainly in in you know it's kind of mainstream post um post-secondary education and and it might have to come down into things like efl Okay. Good. I think it's a lot down to like as as testing companies, it is our responsibility to 
to keep up with that. And no matter what method of testing you use, there was always going to be some people that unfortunately try to game. Um, and there's lots of different gaming methods. And methods are different, whether it's a speaking item or a writing item, even those two, they're, they're different. But gaming methods for online and for paper, they'll be different too. And I think it's about adapting and keeping up with that and learning, learning from it as we go along. But we, we can't assume that because it works for a paper-based test, these methods, that it's also going to work in the same way for online testing. And there's lots of different methods that we can use to detect different gaming things, but people are always going to be coming up with more. And whether that's kind of templating, so using like structures or like kind of keep repeating certain certain words or just things like that. There's, there's different methods. And actually, as testing companies, we need to come up with ways to to keep on top of it. OK, so we've got about three minutes left. So I have to hurry along. So can I jump to another question, Steve? Or a couple more questions. Sorry. Um, this may be one for you, Ricky. Uh, Bino Sarah Paul says, can we print exams in a secure environment? In this case, not the provisional numbers, only the required actual amount need to be printed. Uh, certainly that, that's a solution that we're also looking at. There's, there's a number of security issues around that. And we have to be really, really confident that um, we can maintain the integrity of, of um, the exam process. Um, but certainly even as a starting point, there's a lot that we can do um, to change uh, operational processes around printing. A number of example booklets, for example, have blank pages at the back. Quite often that is as a result of the printing process rather than a sort of specific need for the assessment type. So what can right. we do to cut, cut down on the size of, of the booklet um, in the first instance? Um, but yes, ab yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, no, that's, that's going to be a move that we're going to see in future from a lot of organisations. Yeah, that's going to be happening. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've got another question here from Jamie Dunley. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase it slightly because of time. Many of the changes from, from the pandemic are now becoming long term. Um, the question was, do the panellists all see climate change in the future being a part of the goal of further innovation in assessments and learning, not just a side benefit? Would anybody like to comment on that being pushed to the centre? <laughs> Paul or Steve? Yeah, I mean, that, that was basically my opening statement. I mean, I mean, yes. And I mean, the British Council does have climate targets. It does have carbon targets. But I think those targets were developed without a deep understanding of where we actually are and what we're actually doing. But the fact that we're off the starting block, I think is great. And yes, I, I very strongly believe it needs to be formalised and set. Uh, and it needs a strategy around it to proactively manage those targets to make sure that we meet them. So yes, hundred percent. So it's 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 going to be at the forefront. You think Rick is nodding? Uh, yeah, I mean every every industry in every part of the world is going to have to build climate change into um, what they're doing. It, it's the unavoidable fact now that the world the world needs to change in order to prevent sort of the worst climate. Um, catastrophes and taking place. It's, yeah, it's not just the assessment um, sector. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think it's there. It, 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 it's COVID has no doubt been some kind of incentive. It's a strange word to use, but it's it, it's forced us to do things, hasn't it? Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left now. Um, does anybody from the? Well, I couldn't get to all the uh, all the questions from from the uh, from the floor from obviously on the virtual floor. Would any of you like to to add anything else? And we have got literally got two minutes left. That you were you were you were dying to say, but I didn't give you a chance to. I think there's one thing I wanted to just come in on on the end, seeing one of the questions around um, climate and environmental literacy. Um, mm -hmm. we, didn't, we haven't really we touched on that as as yeah. a as an idea here, but um, yeah, absolutely. I think there is there's a real role for the um, English language testing community to make the language of climate change more accessible to people so that um, a broader range of communities and individuals can have that debate. Um, it shouldn't be something that's only for the preserve of arguably communities and countries which um 
can can access the language. Um, and I think we are going to sort of increasingly be seeing um, climate and sustainability topics um, appearing across a whole range of assessment um, topics um, to help, and that will be a, a medium of of learning for everybody. I think we're, we're all on a learning journey globally. Everybody is, is learning about climate change and there's a real um, opportunity for the English language testing community to, to lead that charge. Well, I, th I think uh, publishers and, and people who develop curricula are already putting climate content in there, therefore logically testing and assessment will, 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 will mirror that. And for me, that consolidates, isn't it? It consolidates the learning if, if, if it's also uh, those topics appearing in, 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 in the tests and the exams. We're very nearly out of time. Thank you very much to all of you for your very, very different insights. I think it was very interesting to get to get uh, people from di different stakeholder groups to, to give a perspective. Um, I apologise for any questions from the floor we didn't get a chance to answer, but it's uh, uh, the, the way of the world with these things. We never have enough time. Um, Clearly, there is, I think, quite a lot of unanimity. There was a lot of thumbs up and nodding uh, amongst you. So clearly, you, you, to use the American expression, you're on the same page in many cases. I think now it's probably consolidating, getting these discussions happening and, and putting it into practice because we don't have very long, I don't think, given the, st the state of the planet. We need to all of us get our skates on and uh, make the best of what we can. So thank you ever so much for your time. And thank you to the people in the audience who came along and uh, have a good weekend. Some of you are well into your weekend. Mine is about to start, which makes my life sound much more exciting than it is. But the weekend is beginning for me now. Thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll hand back to Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you once again to all our panelists. Uh, a very, very thought provoking topic uh, indeed. Uh, so in just a few minutes time, our EBI panel will begin. So, you know, you've got a few minutes to go grab a coffee, uh, play with your cat, and I'll see you shortly. Bye bye. Thanks, guys, again. Thanks. Have a nice day. All of you.